So uh, today I'm going to talk about um, Metro style apps versus websites. And really what I'm talking about here is, is Windows 8 style apps and specifically HTML and, and WinJS applications versus websites. So um, these are native style applications that we're going to be comparing against. And this all started about with Windows 8. And with Windows 8 came the introduction of what's called the Windows runtime. Basically, um, if you're a, a .NET developer, you're familiar with writing this object-oriented code against the Windows platform, and this was called um, Win32. It's the, the software development kit, or the SDK, that you would have been writing against. Now, if you look back in the history a little bit, the, the SDK was written in C, and it had um, you know, very tight rules around how to communicate with it. And with the introduction of all the new hardware, uh, such as cameras and GPS, accelerometers, uh, they had, were at a turning point. And they had to decide, are we going to continue to upgrade these old C libraries and then upgrade .NET and other platforms on top of it to support it? Or are we going to take this as an opportunity to really upgrade from the ground up some of these core um, frameworks that we use to communicate with the Windows operating system and expose those out? So the Windows runtime, it's a full C++ library, and it's built on top of Windows 8 as its core. So from there, um, they've also built part of the Windows runtime as an application model for hosting uh, these new native style applications within Windows 8, which are very touch friendly, the fast and fluid style that they've talked about in many of their presentations. So these C++ libraries are object-oriented, and they're very friendly. Most of them are even using the same APIs that their .NET counterparts would have. And what they did was they provided this application model, also in C++, for you to build whatever type of application you wanted. Now, instead of leaving that at just C++, uh, so everyone who had to write a touch-friendly application for Windows would have to use C++, they actually took it a step further, and they are exposing applications, native, you know, on the actual device applications that run in both .NET and also HTML and JavaScript. So with this comes the decision where you can actually write a native application in HTML and JavaScript, the same language that you would use to write a website. And when you think about tablets, and what you would need to do to write a website for a tablet versus a native app, um, you're left with decisions about which one to choose. So that's what I wanted to talk to you today about, is really kind of do a gap analysis to compare the two and really kind of the differences, and also give you information so that when you need to make the decision or when your boss asks you what to do in these scenarios, you're prepared and you can tell him some of the reasons why you might want to choose native over just doing a mobile website. So we're going to start off talking about really this architectural paradigm shift is what I call it, and it's the difference in the way we write these applications. So it's still HTML and JavaScript at its core, but the way we actually write these applications is completely different than maybe a typical website HTML and JavaScript. So I'm just going to kind of lay the groundwork there and talk about all the things we can do. And then I'm going to start to go into all the different areas where there are differences. Um, the first one I've already mentioned is really devices. All the new hardware that you see that you're seeing on tablets uh, is really plays a big part in, in this, and, and some of the the languages that or some of the features that you need to to take advantage of in these native applications. There's also a number of different Windows 8 specific things. So in order to take advantage of some of these rich Windows 8 features you need to have a native application, right? Websites are not going to be able to take advantage of some of these rich native experiences. So having this, um, a, a native app is going to give you that ability. Next is a hybrid app. So we want our applications, I'm sorry, with this HTML and JavaScript style native application, you can write applications that leverage C++ and uh, C Sharp. So you can do complicated things in other languages that you wouldn't be able to do in a regular website. And the last one I want to talk about is marketing, because while it's not a technical difference, it is a big difference when you come to make this decision and something that you have to keep in mind. So what I'm not going to cover today, uh, I'm really not going to go trying to convince you to follow me, right? I, I am building a lot of native applications. 
Uh, we're building Windows Store applications in XAML and WinJS. We're building Windows Phone applications, and we, we've done a lot of native work. Um, but if websites are working for you, then I think you should continue to do that. Um, you know, do what works best for you. So I'm not trying to convince you that native is the only way to go. HTML5 is also something that, you know, these specifications are still changing in a lot of cases. There's a lot more, they're a lot more out there now, and they're more prevalent than they were. But some of these features um, are not, you know, out there publicly enough or they're still in a, a working specification for HTML5. So what I'm going to do is in the bottom right-hand corner here where you see this HTML5 logo, I'm going to include that on the slides that have some form of HTML5 counterpart, whether it be in the final specifications or some of the working specifications. Uh, I'm still going to note it as a difference, but just, just kind of bear in mind that HTML5 may offer some uh, benefits in that case. I'm also not going to talk about just regular old HTML. I'm assuming that everyone who is here already has a basic knowledge of HTML. Uh, so this is not going to really be an intro course to HTML. It's going to go straight into the JavaScript side of things and, and coding and that. I'm also not going to talk about all the features in Windows 8. Now, there's plenty of features in Windows 8 that enable app native applications to do all types of creative app uh, style applications. But I'm not going to be able to cover all those. I'm really going to be focusing on the differences between the website and the, and the native application to really give you uh, an access into the, the gaps that exist between those two. <clears throat> OK, so I mentioned that there is a web development paradigm shift. Um, this is basically still an HTML and JavaScript style application, but it's completely different than the way we usually do client-server applications. And in order to kind of explain that, we need to kind of look back at client-server applications. So in the case of a regular website, I go to uh, www.joeshardware.com. You're going to send a request from a client into the internet, into the cloud, and then to a server. That server is going to return you back some sort of HTML content, whether it's static or dynamic. Okay? In the case of dynamic content, what you're going to get is the server might look at a database or some form of a file, and it's going to return back uh, a set of records. And then the server is actually going to take the job of kind of looping through all the records, writing out either table rows or list items or something, and then sending that full HTML with all the records and all the, the content down to the server, down to the client. So the new style of application is what's called a SPA. All right, This is a single page application. And it's actually not something that's new. It's something that people are doing on the web as well. Uh, but it, it's a difference in the way that the application is, is kind of served up to the user and really takes advantage of the JavaScript and the, the power of the local machine to do a lot of the processing where, in the previous case, the server was doing all that. So what's going to happen in this scenario is you're gonna, the, ser the client is going to request a page from the server, and the server is just going to send down a shell of an application. This is really just the basis of the HTML content that's required. And then it's going to serve on a big JavaScript file. And in that JavaScript file, what it's going to do is going to make a separate request out to the server and download some form of data, whether it, it be from a database or, or whatnot. It's still going to come in from a service and then send down to the client in a form, usually in a form of, of JSON, which is a JavaScript object notation. And then the client will actually take care of parsing that data and rendering out the table rows or the list items uh, the exact same the server would, except with all JavaScript language or JavaScript code. Now, this is actually something I said that's becoming more popular on the web, but it's actually a requirement within Windows 8 style applications. Because the way they work is when I go to the store and download an application, it's going to pull down an AppX file. And so this AppX file, it's really just a zip file, but it contains the shell of that JavaScript application that we were talking about and all the JavaScript code. So from there, your JavaScript code can be responsible for going out to a web service and download. The, the data just the same way. 
So what are the features that you get uh, for this JavaScript in Windows 8? So um, one of the, the features of these styles of applications is access to the Windows runtime. So I mentioned the Windows Runtime. It's this new uh, framework, this new software development kit that is provided by Windows 8 that gives you access to all the low-level features of the operating system, whether it be access to networking, access to the file system, access to uh, all the new uh, tile interfaces and, and um, devices that you get on your actual machine. The other thing that you'll get with these applications is a framework called WinJS. Now, WinJS is, is a, a set of JavaScript libraries that's built specifically for these types of, of applications, and it provides enhanced support for touch. It also supports specific Windows 8 style controls, and a few other things like asynchronous development with promises, uh, the new version of Windows 8.1 also supports disposable methods and also a scheduler that allows you to prioritize tasks based on uh, system, uh, system priority. <clears throat> so uh, kind of bonus credit for anyone who noticed here, but this is actually not a PowerPoint. Yeah, I have a touchscreen monitor here, and I am swiping between uh, an actual Metro-style application that's written in HTML and JavaScript, okay? Um, I have all this code on GitHub, so you can either follow along or download it afterwards, but it's all available for you. And what we have in this application is we also have an app bar that gives us some extra functionality. So one of the things I can do is open sites in Internet Explorer or open them on, on my desktop. I can also enable debugging, and what, I, what happens if I enable debugging and then choose to open in the browser is we will automatically jump right here into the code where I'll show you how some of these features work. So in the case of that open URI link, what we're going to do is create a link based on our slide data, and this link, actually, if I hover over it, points to the MSDN article that represents the, the introduction to these WinJS style applications. And then I create this new URI object. This new URI object is our first scenario where you're actually seeing JavaScript code that runs directly against the C++ Windows Runtime API. And the way we know that is because of the, the initial namespace here, which is Windows dot. So Windows represents that Windows Runtime API. And I call this just in regular old JavaScript without needing to really feel like I'm jumping from a JavaScript layer into C++ layer. So this may seem like a, a simple job, but actually this is extremely complicated and offers a ton of flexibility in the way you are able to write applications within this new framework. So in this case, after we create a URI, we're going to go ahead and say launch URI async. And then when it completes, we will, you know, uh, we'll go ahead and finish out to the browser. So I hit F5, and it actually launches up our, our application using just whatever the system provides to handle that protocol. In the case of HTTP, the protocol that's going to, the application that's going to handle it is just my, my desktop browser here. All right. So I want to just take a quick little break. I'll flip back over into the code, and I want to show how this application is laid out. So I'll go ahead and run that through. So if I open up Solution Explorer here, you'll see I have a project called Metro Flip Slides. This is the WinJS, the Windows Store JavaScript application. And I created that very, very easily just by saying, you know, file new project. Oh, let me stop this so I can show you. So we can add a new project. And in here we have other languages. Uh, JavaScript, and inside of JavaScript you have Windows Store applications, and you could just create a new uh, blank application for WinJS, or you can create a number of different types of applications, be it a, a grid app, uh, which provides the, the tiled, face, tiled interface that allows you to drill into a, a grouped list and then into an item detail, uh, split app, which is a side-by-side -side item detail, fixed layout, and then finally a navigation app, which is really just the basic, uh, the blank app with the header and the back button set up for you. Okay, 
when you create your new JavaScript Windows Store application, you're going to be given a default HTML. And if we open this up, you'll see it's just regular old HTML5. And what we've included in here is WinJS references. So this is references to our Windows framework for JavaScript, the, the Windows Store application uh, framework. And then we also include our own JavaScript. In the case of this one, we're including a default JavaScript file and also this slide data JavaScript file. Right. If we look at the default JavaScript file, um, there is sorry, an on launch method which handles when the application launch, launches and sets up the app bar, uh, gets your basic page navigation set up. And this is called from the very bottom here, where we just say application.start. So I'm not going to be able to go into to all the details of the application starting, but if you create a, a brand new application, you can browse through that. Uh, a blank application will give you a lot of the details of how these are started up. In this case, Everything within our application is bound to this one WinJS control here called a flip view control. And the items that are going to be in the flip view control come from that slide data JavaScript. So we're basically binding a single flip view control to a, a set of data in an array. And then from there, the, our whole application is flipping through a set of the, this, these arrays here. Uh, if we look here at, at our slide data array, you see we have a bunch of different items. They either have an image or a page associated with them. In the case of the image, I'm just going to show you a slide image like we've seen before. But when we get to some of these later examples, I can actually show you a JavaScript page. In this case, we'll, we'll show the actual camera page. Sorry. So when we get down to here, I'll actually have running JavaScript code for a camera page where we can actually step in and debug some of that functionality. Okay, so let's jump back to our application. Are there any questions so far? <clears throat> okay, so as far as devices, this is one of the big areas where if you build a website, you're not going to be able to communicate with the Windows 8 devices. So you're not going to communicate with the camera. Um, you're not going to be able to communicate with GPS or accelerometer. You're not going to be able to handle near field communication or Bluetooth or really enumerate over any sort of USB device that might be so on, on that device itself or Bluetooth for that matter. Now, when we get to the GPS and accelerometer, you will see that there is HTML5 features for those, but the rest are still not there. All right, for the camera, um, there's tons of scenarios where you might need the camera. Obviously, if you want to you know, take video streaming from the webcam, you'll, you'll need to have access to the camera, but also interesting scenarios around barcode scanning. If you wanted to do barcode scanning directly from a tablet, you need to have access to the camera. So you wouldn't be able to set up an application using a, a website. You have to actually build a native app to do it. What we'll do here is we'll go ahead and launch the camera. And this is going to pop up my, my camera. And I can go ahead and look at the camera, say hi. Take a picture. Ooh, not a great picture for me. And we can instantly have access to that stream for the camera right here within our application. So we'll go ahead. Let me enable debugging, and I'll show you how that works. So we'll enable debugging. I'll launch the camera again. So what we're doing here is, again, you see this Windows namespace. We're calling in directly to the Windows runtime. We are creating a camera capture UI. And then we're accessing these camera capture modes, which is essentially an, an enum. And it gives you the modes which you're going to do your camera capture. We can either do photo, photo or video, or just plain video. And then we say camera UI dot capture file async. Okay? That's going to pop up the UI. And the reason it's async is because while that UI is, is coming up, we don't want to hang our application. You want to release the application, and when some the, the user actually clicks OK, jump back into this code that you see here in the then. And from here, we're able to look at the file that results. So in this case, we get a file object back. 
we can create uh, what's called a blob URL. This is standard HTML5 code for URL.createObject. We'll create an image element and then set the source of that image element to our blob and then write that out to our screen. If for any reason the file is null, then we're going to go ahead and just write no, no photo capture. So if we run this, oh, sorry, that happens when uh, I, I sit too long on the debugger. So go ahead and reload that. We'll launch our camera. I'll take another picture. Click OK. And now you see that file gets loaded into a, a new image element. Okay, so camera is one of our first elements that we're going to need access to a native application to, to leverage. Okay, the next one is our GPS, and for some reason they're not recognizing my credentials, but here you have full mapping capabilities within our native style application. Functionality that's, that's available within uh, a website, but if you want to get access to, my, to coordinates, you can go ahead and, and scan in and it'll tell you your exact coordinates and you can navigate a map with uh, full GPS fidelity. All right. <clears throat> Our next one is the accelerometer. And I'm going to try to actually pick up my laptop here. But if I start the accelerometer, which is a monitoring scenario, you can see I can move my laptop and it, and it gives me access to the accelerometer data that I get from a device. We enable debugging. Should be able to see this. Okay. So when we enable debugging, you're able to see that we have. What's wrong here? We get access to our accelerometer x and y values, and we can determine the angle from that. So our angle here is 0 0.03 degrees. And then from that, I'm just updating the element to, to support that. Now we're going to get stuck here. Let me go ahead and disable debugging. OK. So accelerometer is another one of those features that there, there is some support for this in HTML5. Uh, but if you want to have finer grain access to the accelerometer, then you're really going to want to go in, uh, into a native app. Uh, one other thing, actually, I forgot to mention on, on the GPS side. Um, the other reason why, why I mentioned this is another bit that's not available within HTML5, uh, and that's one of the, the, the fact that when you leave a page within a website, you're no longer receiving any GPS data. Okay, So I can browse to a page, say, that has some sort of form of mapping solutions here, like Bing Maps. I can find my location because the, the website might have access to my GPS data. But once I close down, I, I lose all that access. So if you want to have an application that does monitoring or geofencing and provides some form of notification when you enter a specific geographic location, the only way you're going to be able to do that is to use the, the background task functionality within a native application and get the GPS data within that background task. OK, accelerometer. <clears throat> OK. So next is going to be file I.O. So I didn't mention this before, but your application is going to have access to, uh, is going to need to read and write files at a, at a certain point in time. In the case of a website, you're really limited in what you can do. Now, people can save an image or download a file, uh, and then they can upload an image. But the way that inter is interacting is, is very kind of disconnected. Right? If you need to save a file, it has to go down to the machine from the server. Okay? When you're within a, an actual Windows 8 uh, native application, you have a instant access to these files because you're actually running on the machine itself. So you can read, write files, you can access folders all right there in the, in the operating system. The other thing is that these new file pickers within these Windows 8 applications are extremely touch friendly. And you don't have the full access to those within your um, desktop application. So in order to access those, you need to have a, uh, an actual native app. So the first one I want to look at is a file upload control. So in the case of the browser here, if I open it up, you'll see a typical style um, browse functionality, which I click on Browse. 
I can take an image here. Let's take a, just a sailboat picture and upload. And then I get a picture of, so it had to be disconnected. I had to actually choose this upload button in order to actually send the file up into the server so the server could access it and read from it. Okay. In the case of this file upload in Windows runtime, when I click pick file, and again I choose that sailboat, I get instant access. As soon as that file is read, I get instant access. Now I can, all, I can read a thumbnail of it, I can read the full size image of it, at full control immediately. The other thing you can do within a native application is pick multiple files. So here I can select two or three files real easily, hit select, and I have again instant access to all those files. So let's go ahead and enable debugging and show how that works. So when we click pick file, we jump here into our debugger. And what we do first off is we have to create a picker. So again, this is all object oriented code. We're not actually having to um, you know, create some fancy structure and send it into a method. We're creating a brand new file picker object. We're setting some properties on it. In this case, we're gonna set the, the button text We'll set the start location, which we're saying is our pictures library. We're going to give it some filter types, which just says any files are available. And then we're going to call this method called pick single file async. Now, again, this pops up a dialog and is an asynchronous method. So we need to tell it what to call when the file comes back. So in the previous example, you, set, you saw the weak call dot then, and we had a function in here and that function handled the result of a file. Now in this case, we're doing the same basic, uh, same logical flow, but instead of it being an anonymous function, it's actually a, a real function that's down here called process result. All right, so process result, same style, we have a function which accepts a file, and if that file is not null, or if it's a valid file, then we're going to go ahead and add the file and when we scroll down to add file, you'll see that we're going to call get thumbnail. And we'll do essentially the same code we did last time, which is create an image URL, write that to an image source tag, and we'll also create a name element and just give that some inner HTML give, representing the file name that was selected. All right, so I have another breakpoint here after we get a thumbnail, so we'll hit run. Uh, sorry, I, I took too long again. So pick file. So enable debugging, pick file. Run. Pick the sailing file. Select. So now we've received the thumbnail, so we have access to the file and also access to the resulting thumbnail. And from here, we'll just create an image from the thumbnail and write that out to the screen. So there we go, we have our image selected. Again, that was instant access to that file. We didn't have to upload it to a server or do anything automatically right there in our application. We can look at it and process it and retrieve information about its metadata, but also the full stream data for the file. Okay. The other one is saving. So let's say, for example, I want to save an image. Okay. If it's a, a, a web page, I'll have to, let's open up the web page so we can see that. All you can really do is right click and say save image as, and then you have to pick a location where you want to save that. Now, that requires a user to have to right click and save. Um, if you wanted to download a file, there's a couple other techniques, but essentially you have to have the user click on a link or save the file by clicking on a dialog that says save. In the case of a Windows Store application or a native application, we have access to a file save picker. So all you have to do is click on a button. I can provide a default image name here. I can provide uh, a file type and then the user can navigate to a location. In this case, I can navigate to this sailing folder and just hit select, and there the file is saved automatically into that location, um, again, without having to round trip to the server because this, app, this native application is already running on the machine. 
All right. Now, saving files, that's something you can do from a website. One of these things that you can't do from a website is really have access to a full folder. So let's say, for example, I wanted to extract a full folder structure out into um, some folder on the client's machine. If I wanted to do that from a website, I would have to maybe, you know, download a zip file and provide instructions on how to extract the zip file. Um, and a lot of different scenarios you can maybe think of, but none of them are very user friendly. In the case of a Windows store application, we can just hit save files, select any folder that I want. I'll select that sailing folder again and select the folder. And automatically, I have full control to save multiple files to a single location without having to prompt multiple times or extract a zip file or, or provide special instructions. All right. So you're starting to see a little bit of that power of these native style applications and what they can do over what the, the functionality you would have in a website is. OK. Um, our next one is, is also a picker, but it's not something that they exist at all within a native application. So if you had some form of a social application and you wanted to access social media or, or provide access to special contacts for the user that's on that machine, you wouldn't have any way to do that within a website. If you have a native application, you have access to the, what's called a contact picker, which allows you to provide um, to, to kind of suck in information from your contacts or allow users to select contacts to import. Uh, or anything they want. Here I can call, click on pick contacts. It's going to open up a, a picker of various contacts. I can select somebody and hit select. And then I instantly get email to, to that person's uh, access to that, that person's contact information. Now hopefully Adam doesn't mind me doing that. He's a, he's a technical evangelist over at Microsoft. So hopefully he doesn't mind me showing his email there. <clears throat> All right. Um, the next set of features that we have in a Windows 8 application are going to be OS related features. So these might not be something that are it's going to bother you if you have Windows 7 or you have Macintosh or or something else, but it is going to if you have a, an application that's running on Windows 8, you're not going to be able to leverage any of these features without having a native application. All right. The first one is going to be the app bar. So this is only available to native applications. If you run this inside of a browser, you are going to be left with either the, the browser's app bar or no app bar at all. Uh, the other thing is when you use these applications, you have uh, what they, they usually say that global buttons are going to go over on the right and current selection buttons are going to be on the left hand side. So in this case, I have my global navigation buttons on the right. And then uh, anything related to that current page, like opening up that, that page's details in Internet Explorer, um, are going to be on the left-hand side. All right. So really just a, a bit of functionality that you wouldn't have if you do a website. OK. Next is everything within the charms. OK. So within these Windows 8 applications, every, all the corners really provide something. If I swipe from the, the right-hand side, I'll get access to my, my desktop or any other application that's running. If I swipe from the top and bottom, I'll get my app bar. And if I swipe from the right-hand side, then I'm going to get a settings charm, or, or sorry, the charms bar. Now, the charms bar provides access to uh, searching, sharing, access to the start screen, which I'm going to use to represent tiles, uh, devices, which is represents printing and um, screen sharing and, and projection over to either audio devices or video devices, and finally, settings for your application. Now, if you have a website, you won't be able to access um, these, these features within the, the, sh the charm bar, but with a native application, you have full control over that. So our first one is search. So in the case of search, I can open up uh, this in a browser, and you'll see a typical browser. We go, we get some search, and again, I'll type sailing, and it's going to give me some results. Now, you see this in every single website where they have some form of search, but it's always all over the place. You don't know if it's going to be in, in the on the top right, top left. Maybe it's in the bottom. Maybe you have to click on a link and go to another page. There's no consistency to it. So 
with Windows 8 and with Windows 8.1, they provided a consistent searching paradigm um, that allows you to, to search within your application. And if I go over here to our, our Windows 8 search, you can see I can click on search. And if I just type in sailing here, then I get instant access to do search results right within my application. It's a built-in um, functionality of Windows 8 and Windows 8.1. All right. Now, for the case of Windows 8.1, uh, they also have an in-app search box, which is more of a text box style searching, which gives you access to, to provide a, a, a richer functionality uh, for local searching. Um, but you can still access a, a full global search if, if necessary. All right. Now, in the case of sharing, which is the second charm, um, if you have a website and you're opened in the, the Metro or the Windows Store style Internet Explorer, it will provide sharing, but the sharing is just going to provide a, a URL. So if I click on this, share with mail, then you'll see it just provides a URL, uh, you know, HTTP Bing.com slash images slash search. And this is all we would get from, from a browser-based application is the current URL that that user is on. In the case of a native application, you get a lot more. You can share really whatever you want. So if we start this one, actually let me stop that. Start this one and choose share. Now when I click on the mail app, you'll see I'm able to provide a full image here. So not just a URL like we had in the case of the of the browser, but you can share a full image. All right, uh, the next one is tiles. So you may have seen on my start screen here that I have a tile here called Metro Flip Slides. This is just a, uh, a the standard tile that you get when you build your application. And during your application, you can choose to, to update the tile um, programmatically. All right, this can either happen via a background task or some form of code in your application. And when you update your tile, you can you use a number of different templates. So on the screen here is just some sample templates that are provided. Um, you can use any of these, and there's plenty more that are available. Uh, if you you know open this in Internet Explorer, it'll launch out the application or launch to the list of all the templates. Now, if we go ahead and choose set tile, uh, it sometimes takes a little bit of time. Well, we flip back to the start screen, you'll see our tile gets updated now and we have a, a new image on our, our tile. Okay, so if we enable debugging, I'll show quickly how this works. We'll choose set tile. And what we do here is we have our template types. These are that the list of templates that I was talking about from things like a square block, square image, we have a square peak image, which is the one that you saw uh, on the start screen right now. So square peak image and text, 0, 1, is the one that we're actually creating here. So we're going to get some tile XML. All right. Now, if I look at this XML, oh, let me use the XML browser. This is essentially the XML that defines what a tile should look like for your application. Now, the reason that they're using XML is because this is handled by the operating system. So we're not actually updating the tile ourselves. What we're doing is we're telling the operating system or we're requesting a tile update from the operating system. Now, this can happen in a number of different ways, like I mentioned. In this case, we're doing it programmatically in our application. But we're doing, we have to construct this XML and send it to the Windows operating system. And when they have time, when you know the, the operating system's not overloaded doing other tasks uh, that would maybe affect the user, it's going to go ahead and download the images and, and render the text for the tile and display that on the start screen. So what we do to manipulate this template is we grab our text element. So we're going to grab our first text element, and we're going to append some uh, a text node to that element. And then we're going to set our image source equal to this path called uh, MS AppX. So MS AppX represents a, the Microsoft AppX package. 
and it represents a file within our package here. So in our package, we have a slides folder and a slides32 folder, and then there is a sailing JPEG with its inside of this folder here. All right. Once we've done that, you'll see our tile XML that we showed before has now been updated. And we have our image source equal to our Apex file. And also our text here, we're just using the first line of text to say sailing. Okay. From here, we're going to create a new tile notification based on this XML. So this tile notification essentially is what we're going to be sending to the browser or to the operating system. It contains our content, which is our XML. We can also provide expiration time and also a tag. So given that you have tiles that are cycling, you can tag specific tiles and allow you to replace just individual tiles based on that, that the, the same occurrence of that tag. Okay. Once we have that tile notification, which is the object we want to send, we create a tile update manager for our primary application. So create tile updater for application. And then we send it an update. Uh, we call update on it, giving it the tile notification. And with that, it updates our, our tile. So we switch back to the start screen, and it should still be there. But you'll see our tile is updated with the sailing image. All right, so that is the, the tiles. Same, same basic functionality works with toast messaging and push notification. If you want your application to provide uh, you know, real nice messaging uh, from toast pop-ups, it, really ha it has to be a native application. You're not going to access that functionality from uh, a website. The next one is the, the devices tab. Now, unfortunately, without uh, a, a, an Xbox or some form of projection medium, I can't really demonstrate this feature. But a website's not going to be able to project a certain video element directly to something like your Xbox. But with only a couple lines of code, you can easily take any video element or any audio element within your application and allow the user to project that to any um, you know, wirelessly supported device and project out that content onto either a screen or an audio player with, with only a few lines of code. Okay. Our last one is settings. So on the charms bar, we also have a settings which provides global settings for your application. So you can put anything you want in here, and the users are given a consistent way to access the settings uh, for their application. So all we have to do is choose add settings. And then now when we open up settings, you see we have a new help button or link. And when I click that, it, I can show my own custom content. In this case, I'm showing this uh, flyout, and you can provide anything you want in there, uh, toggle switches, buttons, drop downs, uh, whatever you want. All right. OK, so that's it for application-specific functionality. All right. So again, if you are building a website versus a native application, the only way you're going to access any of that the new fun Windows 8 features is to have a, a native application. All right. The next one is hybrid um, metro and web applications. So with this, this uh, HTML JavaScript applications, one of the things I didn't point out was that it, it's just HTML. So I can easily create. Uh, any sort of HTML content and wrap it in here in, in a, a various a, a number of different ways. Um, in this case, I just have a, a hyperlink out to the W3C. But you can see this opens up opportunities for you to create applications that are actually native uh, and have external components to them as well. Now, um, you have to be careful with this. Uh, I think um, you know it's not you know. You have to review your case to figure out whether it's valid for the Windows Store. But obviously, you can't just create a website that's only uh, a, a hybrid app that has all, all web content, um, because you don't necessarily know if that stuff's going to change in the future. Uh, so it becomes very difficult for them to approve that within the Windows Store. So it's just something to be careful. If you do plan on deploying to the Windows Store, uh, you know, do it judiciously and and um, you know, be cautious about how you're how you're leveraging that that functionality. 
All right. So that was it's kind of a, a more standard way to do hybrid applications. But these new WinJS applications also provide a brand new way to do hybrid, which is called a WinMD component. This is a, a Windows metadata component and allows you to take C uh, JavaScript code and call directly into both C++ and .NET. In this case, in this example, I have C Sharp. All right. So if I go ahead and, and enable the debugger, I can click Execute C++. And what you see here is I'm creating a new Metro C++ component dot class one. And up here, I have two other projects. I have a C Metro C++ component and a Metro C Sharp component. Inside of this Metro C++ component, I have a, C, a class one dot CPP. And inside of here, we just have a Boolean called is prime. And then using C++, we kind of evaluate whether this is a prime number and return true or false. All right. And back in our JavaScript, you'll see we create that new class one and we call into this native component dot is prime. And you'll see actually here in this um, in this tooltip that our native component dot is prime is actually represented in, in as native code. All right into that is prime and without really feeling like I'm going into C++ I can call into C++ right away without any problems at all and here it says is prime is equal to 31 is set to true now same works for C sharp I have here a Metro C sharp component dot class one and all I have to do is just say new Metro C sharp component dot class one and I can call right into this class here, which is a, a, a .NET class called is prime and returns true and false. Right, same deal. Call CLR component is prime, and right there within our JavaScript application, we are able to to call into these two different hybrid modes. Now, there's there are some limitations to this. You can't. Um, you're limited to the objects that you can return, and your components need to be sealed classes. So one of the techniques that, that they recommend is to limit your surface area as much as possible. Um, one of the scenarios I like to use a lot for C Sharp or for .NET is the consumption of SOAP-based services. So um, there's limited support within JavaScript for a SOAP-based service. Uh, but in the case of .NET, it's very easy to just say right click and add a service reference. Now you wouldn't be able to, you know, expose all your services to to this JavaScript application, but you, what you could do is proxy that into a JSON object and just send that the string data over into the JavaScript object, and and provide very interesting hybrid scenarios based on uh, using C# -sharp to do things that it's good at, uh, and then using JavaScript to actually render it out. Uh, as far as uh, C++, there's a lot of scenarios out there using C++ physics engines and doing really rich graphics processing within C++ and allowing JavaScript to then suck that, that information in real easily. All right. The last one I wanted to talk today about was uh, Windows Store. Okay. Now, this comes into two parts. The first one is about discoverability. Okay. Let's say, for example, you are building a game. All right. If you're building a game on a website, well, then you're stuck with the just regular Google searching or, or, or Bing searching or any other form of kind of advertising that you might get. But there's really not much discoverability that you get. In the case of a Windows uh, Store application, you're going to get a discoverability from the actual store. So as people look in the store, they'll see the ratings. They'll see your application can... Um, you know, is is new and rising when you first publish it out, and you can get a lot of buzz just from the Windows Store from a discoverability standpoint. The other side is monetization. Let's say, for example, you you have a, a great idea and you want to start, you know, charging people, um, a, you know, 99 cents or a dollar 99 for your app. There's no real way to. Uh, most people would not do that if it's a website and they're a, you're asking them for their credit card. In the case of a Windows Store application, you can easily add monetization or um, you know, ads or even um, in-app purchases that allow your application to collect money for various tasks. 
and still provide um, and, and allow Microsoft to handle the transaction and pay you directly so that the user has the confidence that they're, they're not giving their credit card out to a number of people and you're still able to, to make a profit on your applications and, and get money back. Okay, this last slide is really just a kind of a cheat sheet of what we talked about. So with a Windows 8 application, you have access to all the devices. Uh, you can enumerate devices. You can access the, the various sensors and cameras that are on there. You have access to all the charms. So if I swipe in from the right, all these charms are, are, access, are accessible from your application. You have access to the pickers. So we showed file, uh, file open and file save pickers, but also folders and contacts. Uh, I didn't show much of the WinJS side, but you have access to the full WinJS library. Uh, we showed the app bar, but also things like these flip view controls, uh, the settings fly out, uh, list views and grids are all available. They also have a very rich data binding um, function, really rich data binding functionality built in, and also navigation uh, either by pages or, or fragments of pages that allows your applications to kind of partially uh, navigate around without having to, to fully navigate to a brand new page. And then the last one we talked about was the, the hybrid web and components. If you do have an actual website, you're not able to provide some of those rich hybrid functionalities like you know using C Sharp or C++ to, to call out to services, um, whereas a, a native app would have that ability. All right. Now, some of what I what I consider the the ideal genres for these native apps. Um, obviously, any high performance games. If you gonna if you think you might need to access some of these you know rich C um, C plus plus performance components, if you want to have in app purchases or or paid downloads for your games, uh, a native app's really probably the way to go. If you want to have really rich native applications or anything that's got geo fencing built in. Uh, you're going to have to look at a native application probably. If you want to access the local file system, all right, and you 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 know you want to have a, a little bit richer experience with how you access the file system, you're going to have to go native. Accessing or any application that's going to leverage it, any of the devices, and then as far as the contact picker I mentioned, if you want to really have some some intimate personal information, you want to have people you know add their contacts or or, or search that the same way then you know, providing a native app is going to give you some benefits there. All right. Uh, and with that, um, I want to say thank you. Again, all the code is available online on my GitHub account, which is linked here. Uh, I've also recently finished a book uh, called Windows 8 Apps, or Getting Started with Windows 8 Apps by O'Reilly. Um, so feel free to check that out. That's, uh, there's information about that on my website. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Carrie or, and see if we have a question. Thank you, Ben. I really appreciate it today. We looks like we do have a question coming in. But in the meantime, I wanted to just say thank you so much for your presentation today. And thank you for everyone who joined us. Uh, so go ahead and ask your questions.